first, then Aeschylus, in expounding the arrangement of his work, expressed himself also as follows respecting the only God. Afar from mortals place the holy God, nor ever think that he, like to yourself, in fleshly robes is clad. For all unknown is the great God to such a worm as you, diverse similitudes he bears. At times he seems as a consuming fire that burns unsated, now like water, then again in sable folds of darkness shrouds himself. Nay, even the very beasts of earth reflect his sacred image. While the wind, clouds, rain, the roll of thunder and the lightning flash, reveal to men their great and sovereign Lord. Before him sea and rocks with every fount, and all the water floods in reverence bend, and as they gaze upon his awful face, mountains and earth, with the profoundest depths of ocean, and the highest peaks of hills tremble, for he is Lord Omnipotent, and this the glory is of God Most High. But he was not the only man initiated in the knowledge of God. For Sophocles also thus describes the nature of the only creator of all things, the one God. There is one God, in truth there is but one, who made the heavens and the broad earth beneath, the glancing waves of ocean and the winds. But many of us mortals err in heart, and set up for a solace in our woes, images of the gods in stone and brass, or figures carved in gold or ivory. And furnishing for these our handiworks, both sacrifice and right magnificent, we think that thus we do a pious work. And Philemon also, who published many explanations of ancient customs, shares in the knowledge of the truth. And thus he writes, Tell me what thoughts of God we should conceive, one all things seeing, yet himself unseen. Even Orpheus too, who introduces 360 gods, will bear testimony in my favor from the tract called Diathekai in which he appears to repent of his error by writing the following. I'll speak to those who lawfully may hear. All others you profane now close the doors. And, O Musaeus, hearken to me, whose offspring are of the light-bringing moon. The words I tell you now are true indeed. And if you former thoughts of mine has seen, let them not rob you of the blessed life but rather turn the depths of your own heart unto that place where light and knowledge dwell. Take the word divine to guide your steps, and walking well in the straight certain path, look to the one and universal King, one self-begotten, and the only one of whom all things and we ourselves are sprung. All things are open to his piercing gaze, while he himself is still invisible. Present in all his works, though still unseen, he gives to mortals evil out of good, sending both chilling wars and tearful griefs, and other than the great king there is none. The clouds forever settle round his throne, and mortal eyeballs in mere mortal eyes are weak to see Jove reigning over all. He sits established in the brazen heavens upon his throne, and underneath his feet he treads the earth and stretches his right hand to all the ends of ocean, and around tremble the mountain ranges, and the streams, the depths too, of the blue and hoary sea. He speaks indeed as if he had been an eyewitness of God's greatness, and Pythagoras agrees with him when he writes, Should one in boldness say, Lo, I am God, besides the one, eternal, infinite, then let him from the throne he has usurped, put forth his power and form another globe, such as we dwell in, saying, This is mine. Nor only so, but in this new domain forever let him dwell. If this he can, then verily he is a god proclaimed.